I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You asked me to come get you. You said you couldn't handle the farm anymore. I would never say that. You did, Dad. <clears throat> I know that you both shared some scenes in Ed Harris's Appaloosa over a decade ago. And I'm wondering if you could take me back to that moment. I mean, I, I'm curious about your initial impressions, impressions of each other and how familiar you already were with each other's work at that point. When I first met Vigo, I, I got to the set. I knew Ed because we had worked on the right stuff and some other things. And mm -hmm. The crazy thing was I used to watch him. He had, he had his banner from his football team hanging on this luxury trailer. And then early in the morning, he would head out. And how did I know this? Because I was watching. <laughs> He'd head out to a mesa with this old beat up pickup truck and watch the sun come up. That's my kind of guy. <laughs> I mean, somebody that's connected to the land he's standing on, you know, which I thought was right. great. I yeah, like my first impression. It's a wonderful <laughs> act, too. I mean, it's a my first impression of Lance was, uh, I mean, I did know his work. I haven't seen all his movies, he's done hundreds of movies, but I'd seen enough of it to realize what a skillful actor he was and what a strong presence he had. I had no idea what he was like as a person. Would he be scary? What, what would he be like? And, um, and I found him to be charming, a really good storyteller with a great sense of humor and an incredible work ethic. I mean, he just, everything about his character, his horse, his weapons, his hat, his posture. I mean, he had really prepared his character like he always does. And I thought that's my kind of actor. That's my kind of person, you know? And, you know, when you meet someone like that, that you really connect with, you think, oh, and you say it, you know, well, hopefully we'll get to do something else together. It doesn't, it doesn't always happen. We might have never met again. And I, I hadn't written Falling at that time. So 12 years or so later, I finished writing the script and I thought, well, who would be a great Willis? Lance Henriksen would be an unbelievable Willis. I don't know if he'd want to do it. You never know. An actor might read it and go, I don't get it. I don't think I'm right for this or I'm doing something else. I don't have time or I just don't like it. But fortunately, he did like it. And we then got to know each other much better because I we had to be patient. It took us several years to find the financing for the movie. But we used that time well. We, we communicated. We worked on the script. We got to know each other and like each other. And, and that just sort of flowed in a really easy way to the shooting. We knew it was going to be really hard to make this movie. And some of the scenes were going to be, we had no idea how we were going to get through them. But, but we were going to do it together. We knew that. Lance, you've previously said that, I mean, this role you, you feel has changed your life. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that more. I mean, we've alluded to your illustrious career, but why does this stand out? One proof is that I feel like we're celebrating right now because we're only a few days away mm -hmm. from it being seen in theaters and stream, whatever, whatever they're doing. But, mm -hmm. but what, what happened was the intensity of playing somebody honestly that is kind of hard to take. You know, he's not an easy guy. He's a, he has a farm. He has a, a life, and it's simple. He's got horses that he loves, and he's, you know, and he's isolated because of the damage he's caused in his life where, where it started to mount up, and, and he finally ends up alone. And his son comes to rescue him. And I, I didn't call it rescuing. I called it, don't try to fix me. <laughs> no, right? You know, that's mm. a different. So, because he felt like he was a full man. And I, I did the abuse, the abusive stuff is just almost an automatic response. It doesn't, mm. it's like, get off my back, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I, I, there was no hate there. It was about miscommunication and, and fear. There were mm -hmm. no mirrors in his house, so he doesn't know how old he's gotten. He doesn't see, you know, he's not looking right. at life way anymore, you know. And and I and I swore to Vigo, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't want to get caught acting in this. I just want to live it. Let us, let us, because he'd written such a powerful script that I felt like uh, the only image I can get of what he had done is. You have two rails that are made, goes off into the distance. You got a train 
and it's on it. And we're not going to stop until we get to the other end. We're not stopping. Let's just do this. And, and it was the most inspired thing that ever happened to me. It was everything I liked about maybe doing a big part in a, in a, in a movie. It was mm -hmm. all of that. And Vigo was like a, a friend who, who, whenever we had a new idea, he would rewrite it into the script. And I've got like, I've got 25 copies sitting right here <laughs> on the table in my house, you know, of the rewrites. And they were all beautiful. They, you know, I mean, it sounds very romantic, but I'm telling you, man, I am <laughs> right now. So well, forgive me. I get a little uh no 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 it's a oh. fantastic performance and i i totally can see why you feel that way um i think i'm curious you know kind of in in response to some of the ways you described willis vigo i wonder I, I mean i think a lot of people might say well we should cut these people out in our lives who don't fully accept us for who we are but but john doesn't really do that and i wondered if you could kind of talk to me about like why why doesn't john do that well, I think if you're someone, let's say you're watching this movie, and I don't, mm. I never think that there's a, it's possible to make a movie that pleases everyone, first mm. of all. But let's say you're watching this movie and you, you're so offended and you think, well, I would just stop talking to that person. Mm. Much easier to say and imagine doing that if you've never been in a situation like John is in, mm -hmm. where you're actually taking care of someone who's older, who clearly needs help mentally and physically, whether they want to admit it or not. And if it's your father, and you realize that his character is so prickly that there's probably no one he's going to accept help from ex except you. And he might, might not even accept it from you. Right. So I'm not telling anybody what they should do. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying John is a saint. He obviously alludes to the fact that in the past they have fought and John is sort of given as good as he's gotten. Mm -hmm. um, he says in one scene, you know, third of the way through the movie, he says, I made myself a promise. I'm not going to react in that way. I want to help you. So you can insult me all you want. I'm not going there. In other words, he's aware of the fact that if he wants to help this man who needs help, he's going to have to take a lot of crap and he's going to have to deal with it. And he tries, he makes a conscious effort. It's not easy. He's not like he's a saint or something. He's just like, I'm making this difficult choice and I'm going to go for it. So for people to dismiss that as either unrealistic or I would never do that, well, that's up to you. Mm -hmm. But some people do do that. And I have some experience with that myself in real life. You know, some people are not easy to deal with. And, and one of the things I wanted to address, which I think is quite timely now in our society, is the limits of communication. Or how do you fix poor or no communication? It's like another pandemic. It's gotten so bad in our country. Um, are there people you can't communicate with? Are there people who don't deserve to be communicated with? I personally don't think so. Uh, I'm more of an optimist in the sense that no matter how hard it is, it's especially important to try to communicate with people that it's difficult to communicate with. And how do you do that? Well, you got to start by listening, listening to understand something, anything about them. Um, not listening to prepare your next response or your attack. Um, not listening so that you can attack and then just dismiss them forever. It's a hell of a lot easier in life to condemn and dismiss people, especially people you don't agree with or who offend you, than it is to actually think a little bit about what they're saying and try to understand why they feel that way. It's just harder, people are lazy. And it's much easier to be self-righteous and go, well, I'm not talking to those people, they're not worth it. That's not gonna get us anywhere. We've seen that the last several years, you know? You know where the door is, my friend. You are such an asshole. And you are a fucking pansy. Heaven doesn't want him and hell keeps sending him back. Hmm.